Next, Sitting at 30 takes you downtown for the weekly luncheon meeting of the City Club of Portland. Live weekly coverage of City Club is made possible in part by TCI and is produced through the facilities of Portland Cable Access. Now we join the City Club for this week's program. About Portland are traffic and, uh, and nearby row houses, but there haven't been enough of those yet to drive people away from Portland. But what will bring people to Portland in the future? Um, we, we don't know. We don't know, for example, whether public investment is necessary to bring people to Portland, and we don't know wh whether the dense fabric of a, uh, of a city with more people in it will be attractive to people. The final question is, what will Portland be like if our present course continues? The answer is very simple, that it will fill out to the edge of the urban growth boundary, and we will have sprawl and gridlock. The question we were not able to answer is what is our vision for a livable Portland in the future? There are many visions for Portland, too many visions for the city of Portland, but there is not a single vision which is our vision. Well, when our report comes out in ab about three or four weeks, there are several things that I hope you'll look, uh, look for in the report. One is that we will have about 20 black and white uh, illustrations, which is a, a city club record and just about broke the bank of the city club uh, budget. Uh, many of those were taken by a uh, member of our committee, Kurt Kress. Uh, secondly, we have a full color centerfold, uh, courtesy of, of Tektronix, who contributed the printing uh, resources, although maybe I should be thanking IBM. Um, uh, thirdly, we're going to have a, a, a cover work of art, which Randy Gregg on the panel uh, helped us with because he printed it as an illustration to one of his articles. And this il uh, work of art shows, I think, the mythic status that the UGB, the Ur Urban Growth Boundary, has achieved. Uh, we'll have a number of interesting examples for you to see of large, medium, and small projects. We will have what I hope you will find to be provocative conclusions and recommendations. And then we'll have a minority report, and that's especially important because it will give you, the City Club members, the opportunity to vote on a very important philosophical issue at the Friday meeting, October 22nd. So I look forward to seeing all of you there. Thanks, Ted. Good afternoon. I'm Lloyd Anderson, president of City Club. Welcome to our program today. Today we focus on urban design in Portland with a distinguished member of panel expert of, of experts. Patty Tillett, member of our Board of Governors and chair of the program committee. With Zimmer Gunsel Frasca uh, partners. Gary Papers, chair of the Urban Design Committee of the Portland chapter of the American Institute of Architects and an architect with Sarah Architects. And John Carroll, developer and principal with Carroll Investments. And Randy Gregg, art and architecture critic for the Oregonian. And he will serve as moderator. On Friday, October the 1st, join us for another urban development program with City Commissioner Dan Salzman Dan will talk about the urban ectopia, integrating urban development and ecological restoration in Portland. All of you have received a letter requesting your support for this year's annual fund. Our goal for this millennium here is $100,000. You've had a chance to give, have your gift doubled this year. A President's Challenge gift in the amount of $3,500 has been established to match every new gift of $25 or more. Please do your best to help reach, us, reach our goal. On October the 14th, the club will host its first open house of the year at the club office. Join us for an opportunity to hear about club events and meet and talk with fellow members and enjoy late refreshments. If you plan to attend, please RSVP Winnie Kane at the club office. Our board host today is seated at the head table, uh, Patty Tillett. He's a member of the Board of Governors and chair of the program committee. He will ask the first question of our speaker. 
Following Patty's question, we will open the program to questions from City Club members in the audience. Broadcast of City Club programs this quarter is made possible in part because of corporate un underwriting from CH2M Hill, Weyerhaeuser, Pacific Care of Oregon. We're grateful for their support. The building of a great city combines a lot of elements, natural setting, timing, leadership, political atmosphere, to name a few. The City Club programs have included many of these elements, including the underbelly of the city, how we care for our poor and the disadvantaged, and it's also included our education and elements of our transportation needs. Many of the public parts of these programs are state and federally financed and more likely controlled by them. But the investment, design, and construction and uses of land are dependent on and can be locally influenced and on the public side, substantially controlled locally. We and our leadership do count on how we shape our future. The atmosphere development brings to mind Camden, New Jersey, where in the last few years, one of their creative ideas for the development of the waterfront in the central area was the building of a prison. Our future looks brighter. To help us with this whole process, we have an interesting panel before us. Patty Tillett, architect, head of the Department of Planning and Urban Design, Zimmer Gunsel Frasca Partnership. Patty has had over 25 years of international professional experience in London, Cologne, Nigeria, and Osaka before coming to Portland. His community activities, in addition to City Club, include heading the Willamette Light Brigade, a group dedicated to lighting the bridges of our fair city. Gary Papers, Director of Urban Design and Planning, Sir Architects, has been a project designer of planning, urban design and architectural projects, both public and private. He has special expertise with neighborhood pedestrian and transit-oriented design, architectural and urban design guidelines, and interactive charrette processes. He teaches and is involved in a variety of community activities associated with his profession. John Carroll heads Carroll Investments. His organization owns and manages real estate exclusively in the Portland metropolitan area. John has developed real estate individually and in ventures with others for the past 15 years. He's been a strong supporter of planned and healthy growth. He serves as chairman of the City of Portland Streetcar Advisory Committee, Portland Streetcar Car Incorporated, River District S Steering Committee, and a committee of, livable of a livable future. Our moderator is Randy Gregg, art and architecture critic for the Oregonian. Randy comes out of a background of journalism, art, and architecture. He received his master's in fine arts from the University of Washington and in 89 became art critic for the Oregonian. In 94, he won the uh, Chemical Bank Distinguished Award for Art Criticism. That same year, he pursued architectural studies at Columbia University. Since returning to Portland in 1995, his coverage of architecture has widened to become an urban design, urban history beat. In addition to lecturing, he's widely published in national and international magazines. Randy, we'll begin the program with you. Thanks, Lloyd. Uh, thanks for turning out. I mean, this is really incredible. I didn't expect so many people here. Um, this, the impetus for this discussion really began with a question posed um, by a, a couple of transplanted New Yorkers, uh, Irwin and Lily Mandel. And um, the central question they posed was, what would it take to push Portland beyond being just a good city to being a great city? In my experience, this is just an excellent question because I think in Portland we spend far more time worrying about how to protect what we have rather than thinking about really what we could do to uh, propel us someplace else. 
When I first came here 10 years ago, I was frankly flabbergasted at the number of times during my first few months that uh, uh, my disappointments and criticisms of things I saw were met with uh, uh, the phrase, well, it's pretty good for Portland. It seemed like a mantra or something here, I swear. Um, having arrived from Seattle, a place in which uh, so many ambitious initiatives uh, were nonchalantly sort of uh, dismissed as not being as good as what was going on elsewhere, I found myself uh, coining a, a dialectic for the two cities. Um, Seattle is a town that thinks it's a city, and Portland is a city that thinks it's a town. <laughs> well, uh, today I think we should show, throw off the shackles of uh, townish ambitions towards the good enough. And um, what I'd like us to do is sort of look out over the 200-foot blocks and imagine a real city. The ground rule I've given to our panel today is that uh, we're not, uh, that here in, here in Portland we're doing, what we're doing is not good enough. What we're going to do is talk about what's wrong with the city, what's making us third and fourth best even on our best days, and we're going to talk about what we need to do to change that. I posed this question to a few people in my travels the last couple of weeks, um, and I have a few of their responses just to sort of uh, uh, get a sense of what people are thinking about out there. Christy Edmonds, uh, uh, director of the Portland Institute for Contemporary Art, thinks that we need more internationalism. Uh, she observes that the cultural richness um, of the metropolitan area is collecting on the edge of the city in the suburbs in uh, uh, Southeast Asian, Russian, Hispanic communities. And if we could make a way, uh, find a way to bring that into the urban <coughs> core, uh, that one thing would make a huge difference. Barbara Roberts thinks we need more pride. We don't celebrate our history enough. We can't point to where things happen. You go to a place like New Orleans, she says, and the average citizen knows history. The city itself demonstrates history. Vera Katz thinks that uh, uh, the, a great city creates well-designed public spaces that inspire, arouse, and provoke us. And she thinks we're already on our way with the classical Chinese garden, the River District Sculpture Garden, the River of Lights, and of course, the capping of 405. Charlie Hales had a little more whimsical idea. Um, have the Oregon Symphony play the 18th 12th Overture at Waterfront Park and have the grand finale of Explosions be real, blowing up the Markham Bridge. <laughs> um, Dan Saltzman, a little drier. Uh, environmental design in the form of better groundwater use and treatment and design competitions for that. And uh, maybe Dan can flush out that idea a little more next week for you. <laughs> Ethan Seltzer uh, thinks that it's really important that we preserve the things that keep us terrific already. Uh, number one being that we do business on a first name basis here. Some people mistaken that for informality, it's access, he says. Secondly, we need to add more places to our collective experience. Uh, we don't make enough uh, use of uh, what the rest of the world is up to. We're good at bringing the world to Portland, he says, but not very good at getting Portland out to the world. Jim Francisconi. Two words, more Italians. <laughs> a little Italy, Chianti instead of a Chardonnay, Florence is a sister city, exchanges between the Portland Art Museum and the Uffizi. Um, in, in what I found to be sort of typical form for, for Jim, um, I got a call 10.30 last night uh, from him with a second thought. Uh, a world-class university like MIT or Harvard, but that's public, that it's urban, that reaches into our high schools and neighborhoods and ups the 30% uh, of our kids that go to college. My uh, boss, um, Sandy Rowe, thinks that we need bolder leadership um, that doesn't try to, uh, so hard to please everyone, uh, leadership that develops a clear vision, takes risks, and has the commitment to carry out that change. And our provocateurs, uh, Irwin and Lily, um, think that we need to stop paying lip service to public transportation and then go and build a nine-story parking garage in downtown. They point to the soon-to-be-approved uh, Hilton Hotel, which under the city's FAR bonus program will receive almost two extra floors just for installing bicycle racks. Um, let's face it, says Erwin, the great cities of Europe are all built by imperial rulers. What we need is a real vision for the city and a plan for carrying it out. Again and again, this uh, idea of leadership comes up, especially among those vying to become leaders. Um, Brian Scott put the theme most bluntly. We need more leaders like Neil Goldschmidt. That's what uh, makes great cities a lineage of great leaders. Well, so I went to Neil. And the first thing he noted was how few people seemed to regard him as a great leader when he was actually leading. <laughs> 
His approval rating, he says, shot up 10 points on the days immediately after he took the job of Secretary of Transportation. <laughs> He contends uh, uh, our current city council is being given way too little credit. Uh, the city is physically bigger than when he was mayor. The issues we're grappling with are far more complex. And he adds, it's much easier to look, look brave when your back is against the wall and you're facing the firing squad. He does, however, lament the lack of passionate students of the city on the council. For him, what, what might make Portland greater is great places to walk, hence his work on the extension of the park blocks and his support of Mayor Katz's hopes for capping the freeway. But the most important thing, he thinks, is to double the engine power of PSU, perhaps creating an alliance with OHSU. It's a one plus one equals three, he says. But he also adds, my stated goal as mayor was always to make Portland the best city of our size in the world, and I think we're losing out. He adds, great cities take a long time. It's like painting over the same canvas over and over again. And so today, what I think we're going to explore is what might be the next draft of this painting. Um, we're going to start out with Patty Tilly. Thank you, Randy. The question is certainly a very provocative one, a very good one. How can Portland grow from a good city into a great city. And the first question that that prompts is, well, are we a city at all? Where I grew up, there was a very clear definition of a city. It was a place that had a cathedral. And that's not because we're, we're all very devout. It's rather because cathedrals in Europe typically take one or two hundred years to build. And the idea is that if you've got one, there's been um, an accumulation of culture over time. The cathedrals are sort of... Um, indicate a species like the, like the spotted owl. And after a couple of hundred years, there is a cultural duff accumulated in the place, which, uh, which, which speaks to a kind of maturity, an urban maturity. Um, in the West, the term city isn't really uh, a title that you earn. It's rather one of aspiration. And I think of Junction City, just south of Moppin. There was probably one shack there when it was named Junction Sh City. And, and the, the founders certainly had great dreams for it. It's not about the size of the place either. Um, I think Bath and Chartres probably qualify as cities. I think Gresham and Tuckwiller probably don't, but they're about the same size. It's not necessarily about age either. Tokyo is a relatively young city, but uh, Japan has a surprisingly portable culture. And a good example of that is the way the temples at Ise are replaced every 20 years. The idea you can move culture from one place to another. And when, they, when the capital was founded in Tokyo, it was founded with a sort of ready-made culture, and so the age was not such a consideration there. The culture that's particular to Portland is still emerging, whether you look at writing or fine arts or cuisine or urban design, but it doesn't pervade Portland much beyond the core districts yet, and that seems to me um, critical. You can be out in some of the uh, areas close to the urban, uh, urban growth boundary, and you might as well be in um, subdivisions almost anywhere in the country. It just hasn't hasn't had much effect there yet. So I think something which is of great interest is what are the thresholds that one needs to cross in order to qualify for the title of city? And I think there are, the, uh, there are three, the three Ds, if you like. Cultural diversity, cultural depth, and cultural dispersal. Good afternoon. Uh, I have to say briefly that we've sat a couple times and, and talked about this, this uh, topic. And uh, at every one of the sessions, Randy would say, but remember, we got a problem and we're trying to fix it. And I ended up being the cheerleader throughout all the discussions. And so I have to confess that my comments really are, are more positive in nature, but I still think there's a theme and there's an opportunity for our future. When we look at Portland, we think of, of uh, our current successes, but the successes of the cathedral, as well as Portland, are based on a good, solid foundation, well planned out, uh, some thought given to how ultimately it's going to look. Uh, what's great about Portland is that it has a social and it has a community infrastructure that's in place and it's working, and it's working very well. Uh, in the early years, Portland was blessed and also dammed with a very narrow economy. There was timber, there, there was timber, and then, then there was timber as well. And those of us that are my age now uh, remember what the early 70s looked like as we were transitioning from this timber economy. We were isolated. We suffered through the bad economic times. But the one thing that we had that was very, very important 
and will, and will be important is the fact that we had good leadership. I had a couple questions. Who were those people that platted the park blocks? Who created the downtown plan? Who created Waterfront Park? Who abandoned the Mount Hood Freeway? Who insisted on light rail? Uh, who put together the neighborhood plans? Uh, who's advocating, who advocated the streetcars? Who built the convention center? Who came up with the idea of the Bull Run Reservoir? Who put together the park system? Uh, Bill Roberts, the likes of Glenn Jackson, our friend Neil Goldschmidt, Charlie Hales, uh, Vera, thank you. Uh, people like Lloyd Anderson during the very uh, transition times of the, of the, at the port, taking a leadership role and providing some guidance and, and some infrastructure. But in addition to those very high profile people uh, in our community at the time were the people, the likes of a Chuck Stalsberg at the Bureau of Buildings or a Margaret Mahoney or Felicia Trader or Jeff Jocelyn, who I, I wrote this before you showed up, Jeff. I just want you to know that. Um, good architects. Thanks, Norm Zimmer. Uh, and Allie, thank you for having such a wonderful father. Uh, good developers. Okay. Uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll talk about that. Uh, and there was a good developer. I can't remember his name, and if somebody can uh, tell me this name, uh, it, it, it had to do with how we got Forest Park. Uh, I think it had to do with a subdivision gone wrong at the wrong time in the economy. Uh, went into bankruptcy and ultimately was consumed by the by the county and set the stage for one of the largest, the largest, uh, in-city park uh, in the country. And whoever that person is, thank you very much for having made the stride and failed. Uh, these were people with the ability to change courses, uh, to speed up, uh, to slow down. Uh, these are the people that balanced the environment with the future vision. Uh, I think we are a great, a world-class city because we have not sa sacrificed our ability to grow responsibly. We're still in control. It's a very important piece. Should we rest on our laurels? Absolutely not. We must strive to improve, grow responsibility, and take on initiatives that keep us in the forefront. What's important about Portland to me is the fact that the neighborhoods are so strong. We have advocates for every section of this town, every section of our community, and it's an important dialogue that has to go on. We shouldn't lower our expectations to match our results. We shouldn't lower our quality of life standard in the name of growth. Uh, what will make us a world-class city? I think what will make us a world-class city is the fact that we have a history, we have a good history, and that we have a, a, a track record of balancing the environment and our, and our growth. Uh, I think, you know, from my perspective, the vision, uh, the vision down the road 20 or 30 years should include maintaining that ability to continue making choices. And when we give that up, we're no longer a good community, a great community, or a world-class city. We're struggling to survive. And I think that long-term vision has to include balancing all those alternatives. Thank you. When people ask me how I would define urban design, it's very tricky because there's a full menu from street improvements and selecting street lights all the way up to the potential to design a whole new community fresh from the ground. But I like to respond by saying that to me, urban design is the conscious design of the city as a work of art. Not just the objects, but the relationships. And that, in many ways, is the most important. We can have incredibly handsome buildings. We can have spectacular parks and streetscapes. But we have to be careful that those handsome buildings aren't in the wrong place, where the school might be or should be. And so I think it's really important when we look at the challenges that we remember the full range of scales. Portland has done an excellent job at the smallest and, I would say, next scale up. We have some of the most well-respected and admired design review guidelines for handsome buildings and park design. And I also believe we're blessed with one of the most innovative and probably copied or admired or emulated regional structures so that the 
region as a whole works together for common objectives rather than have certain jurisdictions try to undercut one another or poach on somebody else's particular industry to just, to just grab jobs for them. It's all the things in between where I think we need a lot of work. And we try very hard. We have excellent talent. But we also have, I think, a tradition of doing the smaller scale, incremental projects that is so revered that that sensibility gets in the way, even when a more dramatic opportunity presents itself. So I'm, I'm basically saying that I believe we should continue to do this when it's appropriate. For example, an infill project in a really complex neighborhood. Yes, we shouldn't just make that a grandstanding opportunity for the building or for the project. But we ought to know when we have a wonderful opportunity and seize it for all that it's worth. For example, The East Bank Freeway has been on our agenda to be studied over and over again over the past few years, past few decades. We need to get off the dime. The city of Melbourne, Australia, is very comparable to Portland, a very similar situation. And in a matter of five years, during a fairly flat economy, they managed to recover an entirely decrepit industrial waterfront and turn it into the complement to the rest of their downtown. They now have a two-sided river. We can learn from these folks if we choose to realize that we can learn from other places just as much as they learn from us at the smaller incremental scale issues. Another opportunity I think we should seize much more aggressively, and I'm on one of the uh, uh, focus groups, planning groups for the Lewis and Clark Bicentennial, but we seem to be approaching it in a very small scale, diversified, decentralized way. And I look at what Vancouver, BC did when they had their expo. And they had a long range plan for how that land would be reused and has now become a crucial ingredient in their whole waterfront revival. So we can learn from others. And I think a final point would be that as we learn to seize these outstanding opportunities, we still do the incremental small scale things well because together they provide the contrast and the complexity that makes a great city. To me, a great city is a place where you encounter new things, where you don't worry if you encounter a stranger or a new idea, because those things overlap and create interesting combinations and, and contrast that create dialogue. And that has to do with design style as well as cultural overlap. You can get overlap of cuisine because you suddenly have two different ethnic groups living side by side, and all of a sudden a whole new cuisine is invented. We have to become more bold about seizing those uh, opportunities for, I guess you might say, progressiveness and progressive expression. If a great city is made up of several key themes, we have a wonderful start. We have very shared values here that is across the cultural and economic spectrum. It's remarkable. We also need to develop more courage to implement those values. We need to stop watching the poll takers and watching how much perhaps friction or resistance we might generate to seize an opportunity. We have excellent human capital. I do believe we have talent that is untapped. And we also have a wonderful physical culture that expresses who we are, but not all of the dimensions of who we are. And certainly, I think, when it comes to the conscious planning of the city as a larger city organism, not as a nice building, not as a particular max project, but as a complex organic whole, we can certainly do a little more bold, innovative work. Thank you. Okay, um, I'm going to pose a couple of questions to the panel because that's my prerogative as a moderator. Um, and then we'll get to Patty's question and your questions. Um, we uh, have a, a really a fairly strong record in historic preservation Portland, in Portland, uh, attested to by the recent uh, historic renovations of City Hall, the library, and now the retrofitting of the Portland Art Museum Hoffman Wing. Uh, meantime, other cities have uh, built new libraries, new city halls, new museums. We spent um, a little over $28 million on uh, renovating City Hall and about a, uh, slightly more to build a new city development building that no matter what Dave Kish says was not enough money. Um, are we hiding 
in nostalgia afraid to uh, make new history? And if so, uh, uh, what exactly is our problem? Patty? <laughs> Well, yes, we are hiding in nostalgia, and I think the problem is, uh, in part, that ever since the Portland building, which people either absolutely love or absolutely hate, um, there has been an awareness of awful exposure to any public figure who, uh, who proposes a new building. And I think it'll take a while yet for that, for that uh, paranoia to disappear. <laughs> John? Uh, the, the public paranoia is an interesting, interesting thought. Uh, if you would allow a leader to be a leader uh, and not suffer the, the wrath of the, of the media, uh, it might give them an opportunity. Present company, uh, It might give them an opportunity to take some bolder strokes. But I also feel that we're not particularly hiding. I think there's certainly some market pressures that come to bear. You've got to be pragmatic in your view of, of how things are going to evolve. There are only so many uh, institutions, large corporations in the country that can afford to take on projects that don't make, don't make economic sense. So part of our success has been our prudence in, uh, in designing and building projects that do work in the marketplace. And I think it's a timing issue. Gary, okay, thoughts? Well, I think, as you know, I actually think the library renovation, city hall renovation, and to a degree, even the museum, they're, they're actually wise and appropriate places to do a reinvestment in the culture we already have, both for economic, sustainable reasons and for, you might say, cultural continuity. I'm more concerned where we have virgin land, so to speak, that we carry that same sensibility, old style buildings and old style thinking, into places that don't even have that, as, as Patty described it, that kind of, that base of, of cultural duff, I think is your word. So that, for example, in the River District, North Macadam, and eventually the Central East Side, we will have a lot of land that's available to try new things, but not to ignore the history that's there, but to assimilate it in a more refreshing way. Um. To follow on that question, though, I mean, if, if we're really not looking to the public sector or the major institutions to uh, uh, create some sort of groundbreaking uh, 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 project, some sort of catalytic project that will grab the public's uh, uh, imagination, then it sort of seems like we're left looking at private developers. And uh, starting with John, I would really like to hear about uh, uh, what exactly do you think it is that's keeping private developers from um, trying something more adventuresome, to, to try to uh, uh, really catalyze the uh, uh, public imagination? Well, first I would say I think the private development community is doing that in some, some very, very obvious locations. Certainly Homer Williams and the Hoyt Street Properties effort the old uh, rail yards, uh, 5,000 units of housing, uh, uh, an environment in which there's parks being developed, an environment in which they're proposing schools, uh, balancing market rate and affordable housing. That's a pretty bold stroke. The, there, are other, there are other opportunities. I mean, certainly uh, the Snister family and the Zydell interest down in North Macadam, there's a huge uh, a parcel of, uh, parcels of land down there that I think will be available over time. And I think five, ten years now, people will look back and say, wow, that was a pretty bold stroke, uh, taking those kinds of uh, those kinds of risks. But again, it's a market rate driven exercise. It's a market driven exercise. And you're not going to find the private sector going out and making uh, premature decisions. They make, make investment in infrastructure, but they're going to time it to the market acceptance. Gary? I think in two, three hundred years, Nobody's going to know what the market forces were. They're going to look at the physical results, and that's going to be the testimony to what we wanted to do and what we could do and were willing to do. And yes, we have to be realistic and help with the implementation. We don't want to create things that are shells that are unrented or buildings that are um, un impossible to maintain. But we, we have to take the long view and make sure that they're as buildings, they're built for quality and durability. And also, I think, as a plan, as a neighborhood, it has the basic elements in place for long-term viability. And that things aren't just moving incrementally based on whatever the flavor of the month was for development. 
And so you have to anticipate where the open space needs to be. All great cities have had some kind of marketplace open space as the kind of origin or at least a key organizing element. And you can't just wait and then say at the end, oh, here's a little leftover sliver of land. That'll be your park. You have to anticipate some of these things. And that's what planning is all about, is a reasonably flexible anticipation. Patty, I'd like to sort of uh, shift shift the uh, question a little bit to you, because uh, um, I think there's also a role potentially for architects to play in this. And, and, and certainly, uh, uh, ZGF has had an opportunity to, do, uh, to play that role. Um, yet, I, I would really say that uh, they've been uh, uh, sort of the, the paragon of conservatism. And I'm wondering what you would think, what, what you think the role in the sort of dynamic between the architect and the developer is. What, if there's something that could shift in that role that might push us a little further out? Well, let me answer the first question first, because you, um, uh, you hit on something that's relevant there. I think that one may, has to make a great distinction between bu uh, buildings and other development which is conspicuous versus that which is intrinsically good. And I think what uh, distinguishes Portland from its sister cities up and down the West Coast is that it's always been a conservative sort of city. A lot of the other economies, San Francisco, uh, Seattle, have been based on a boom-bust economy. And if you look at those cities, and there are others around the country like Houston and Denver, you'll see a tremendous spate of very ostentatious development. And it catches the, the eyes, not only of the uh, public at large, but also the publishers of architectural magazines. And they cult they, it influences what the thinking is around the country. I think that in Portland, uh, we have for generations had this sort of conservatism about uh, not, not being flashy about our money and uh, uh, taking decisions deliberately. For that reason, there's a reluctance to do anything flashy. And I think that that has got a great deal to do with the particular kind of architecture that emerges here. Um, I'd argue that there is a great deal of uh, interplay between the developers and the architects over the influence of the building over the built environment as a whole. And uh, it's really fundamental, I know, to, to most of the work that we do, if not all of the work we do. Um, there is no great ambition to produce the, the flashy project that gets into the international uh, magazines. That's not the object of the exercise. The object of the exercise is to build community and build it well and provide vessels for that community that really fit its, its own aspirations. But isn't part of building community creating a sense of excitement occasionally? Yes, there is. Um, but one doesn't have to go to Las Vegas to be excited. <laughs> <laughs> OK, with that, I'll let you have the first question back now. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is a question to uh, all of the panel, and it's a fairly simple one. Um, and that is, uh, what opportunities for really bold strokes has Portland missed in the recent past? And what opportunities for making bold strokes might lie in our immediate future? John, do you want to begin? No. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, Everyone thinks a bold stroke is a 120-story building that shadows over the community. I mean, it, that's the kind of definition of bold strokes. And again, I, th I think there's an opportunity to, to uh, take what we've got in motion uh, and encourage a, a higher level, as, as Gary has, has suggested, a higher level of quality in terms of the architecture. I think there uh, is a responsibility on the part of the public sector that's been the, that's not been lived up to. It is a huge hole in the fabric, architectural fabric of this community. And it's what I call the uh, palette of materials uh, that have been used in public projects to date. Uh, broken face CMU block with dry -it skin and some LP lap siding is not what I would describe as quality materials that support the uh, evolution of good architecture in a community. And if the public sector is going to take the lead by investing public dollars, I think there's an opportunity for the public sector to invest quality dollars in quality architecture. Uh, so. Uh. I, uh, I actually like John's emphasis on materials. Uh, our committee once proposed that the city replace the 
locker room bonus that Randy referenced earlier with a quality material bonus because we are consistently seeing projects being driven down to a level that we, we really don't think they're going to look palatable in 15, 20 years. And these should be around for 100 years. But um, besides that focus on, on materials, a couple of opportunities I think are on the horizon that we could still shape into something not flashy. I don't think the goal is to make everything flashy and, and sort of of the moment. Um, all great communities are made up of fabric and landmarks. And occasionally landmarks are public buildings and occasionally not. But they are opportunities to really pull out all the stops, both in terms of quality and I think in design inspiration. Um, I also think that we have a couple of open space projects that are underway right now, Park Block 5. And the format in which that will be designed is still being elaborated. Why did we get Pioneer Square? It was an open design competition. The best ideas were drawn out of our collective community and then refined to deal with the constraints of the situation. But we didn't start with the constraints. We didn't design it by committee. We let some people who really are good at this go all out and then worked it back into something implementable. I think Park Block 5 could be a similar exercise. Randy, you get to answer this one as well. OK. Um, I'm, I'm struck by the contrast in uh, the era uh, in which the, the Portland Art Museum was first built and, and you know, the current era of its expansion. In 31, uh, the, when it was first built, uh, the country had crashed, yet the museum's leadership proceeded with a young, virtually untried architect who ended up designing what we now regard as an early modernist masterpiece. Uh, in the late 90s, the museum has initiated the largest fundraising drive in, in, uh, for a cultural institution in uh, Oregon history, um, and actually just recently raised the target uh, um, of that fundraising effort from 40 uh, to 45 million dollars. Um, yet, for as well as they've done this, um, and particularly in terms of raising 20 million dollars for the endowment, which is really incredible and smart. I still feel that it was a tremendous missed opportunity to raise the bar of architecture in Portland. And I don't mean uh, um, in, the, in the way that was so frequently um, uh, raised as a response to what, when I was uh, making these criticisms um, in the early development of that project in terms of hiring a flashy architect. Um, but to really look at a number of different solutions. Um, I think, you know, one of the interesting projects recently in, in Seattle has been the Seattle Library, where they did look at uh, world, world renowned architects, but they didn't create a design competition, they created a relationship competition. Who are we going to work with? Who can, do we feel like we can, you know, move forward with uh, um, over time? I mean, they, they, you know, they gave the vaguest ideas of what they might do for the design, and, and what it was was a, you know, an, an effort. It was kind of uh, uh, essentially dating um, and and saying, okay, who are we going to, you know, go forward with? As far as opportunities coming up, I think there's many, but the um, two that stand out in my mind are uh, uh, the brewery on Burnside. Um, I think that, that we need to scrutinize that project extremely well because it's going to be moving fast from what I understand uh, the asking price for the property is. Um, in order to make that deal work financially, it's going to have to happen really quickly. And I don't think we need, we have to be careful to not be caught up in the, we need to do something there, so let's do anything. Um, let's really make this like the best project that can possibly be. The second project I think is going to be uh, uh, potentially tremendously catalytic is, is uh, uh, the Adidas uh, project in, in North Portland on the old uh, Beth Kaiser site. Uh, and that's another one I hope that we can look at very strongly because, I mean, that's going to so, uh, so change that area, potentially for the better. Um, and, and, you know, I hope so. Um, but the last thing I would like to add is, is um, I think we need to find some initiative, and I don't know if it's through parks or through some other means, um, to give Portland's Neighborhood Association something to build. Because what uh, increasingly I have witnessed is a steady change um, from the neighborhoods being sort of collectively invested in downtown to being uh, collectively invested in trying to keep their lifestyles the same. And while I totally respect that and, and would you know, do the same in, in my own neighborhood, um, what I would really like to see is some focus on making something instead of always stopping something.
Matteo Lucio, City Club member. In um, our, the text of our program today, there is the phrase, growth is inevitable. And that seems to be the assumption underlying growth management, land use planning, uh, economic development, and so forth. However, to some extent, that's a self-fulfilling prophecy because we are subsidizing growth. There's a new organization in the state called Alternatives to Growth Oregon, started by Andy Kerr and a few others, that is starting to research and propose alternatives uh, to growth in, in terms of how to slow it down and, or maybe even stop it. I like uh, the panel's thoughts on that, whether growth is in fact inevitable, uh, whether it's good, and if it's not either of those, uh, should we be do doing anything about uh, slowing growth? Let me begin by um, making a comment about the growth. The, the density report that we heard about at the beginning of this se session talked about 470,000 uh, new souls in, in uh, this community. Of those, 40% will come as a result of births over death. So we're not just talking about a huge influx of, of people from elsewhere. Uh, to thrive, to do well, a city needs to do that. A city also needs to have new people coming back. There are a great many Oregonians grow up. Um, they're convinced that this place must be parochial because it's so far from New York and LA. They go off to college, they spend two or three years in other parts of the country, and then they come back and they bring back with them intellectual wealth. And that's enormously important for the continued um, uh, uh, um, growth of our community and has a lot to do with our becoming a great city. So I think we need to have that. Um, Gussie McRoberts has a great, uh, great comment. She said, density is the problem, design is the solution, and I couldn't agree with her more. I'd like to um, just quickly respond that I'd like to switch the word from growth, which has all of these connotations of, of out of control, unmanaged, et cetera, et cetera, to change. And I think all organisms change and evolve, and I think you can develop what in the biological world is called steady state growth, where you don't do things in such a way that it causes cataclysmic disruption. And I would also like to suggest that there's a way for us to grow differently. Uh, I'm going to borrow an analogy from a famous urbanist, Leon Creer. How does a family grow? Do the parents just keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger? <laughs> no. They reproduce. And the wealth that comes from change and growth in that way is distributed to other communities. And hopefully they each have their own distinct identity. They're not just one big, sprawling, homogenous community. You can choose which type of community you want to live in, because now they have two or three vital choices, rather than one that has become a kind of homogenized, difficult to really pin down identity. Um, my only response is, I, I, uh, why do we have to fear growth? I mean, I'm kind of looking forward to density. I like congestion. <laughs> um, <laughs> You know, I mean, it, it, when it's... You just came back from New York. Well, <laughs> no, I actually haven't been to New York. But I think that that's, you know, the topic of our discussion, what, does, what is it going to take to propel us into being a great city? One thing is going to be not fear of congestion and not fear of growth. Uh, Jim Zarin, City Club member. Um, it seems to me another aspect of a great city is a great public realm. And um, there's been a lot of allusions to it in the, in the various comments today. But uh, one of the things that many of us who are involved in, in this growth stuff and the quality of life and density are saying is that we, it seems like we have an unending problem of an inability to fund the public realm, the public transportation systems that are going to make this a great city, keep it a great city. So I'm curious about your thoughts about our ability and our need for leadership in, uh, in the, in the you know, unsexy public finance area, a way of mobilizing the public to support the investment we need in public transportation and the parks, urban amenities, the public realm to make this the city we need it to be. Because without those two, it seems we can have all the great buildings in the world, but we won't have a great city. So I'm curious about your comments. Rainer, I'd like to take a cut at that. Uh, I, I, the bold stroke question, I didn't get a, get a chance to get to the uh, continuation, the development of the north-south, the light rail system, as well as the streetcar system. Uh, 20, 20 years, 30, 40 years from now, you're going to look down the road and say, how are we going to get across town? And if we grow and evolve like some neighbors to the north or neighbors to the south, we'll find out that we can't and that we'll find ourselves compartmentalized the way our neighbors to the north and south are. They live in North Seattle. They live in South Seattle. They live in, in Polesbo. Uh, they don't live in Seattle, per se, and, and commute around. So I think transportation is 
transportation infrastructure is very, very important. The second thought is until we actually start paying the real cost of the automobile and the transportation, the street, impro the street improvements, street maintenance, and we st until we start doing what I th think the Europeans have done very well, which is charge what it costs to create a transportation system that works, uh, we're going to always have the problem with funding because the contrast is always going to be cheap gas, even though it's $1.70 and change now. But the contrast is always going to be, well, we're getting gas for $1.75. I can still afford to drive. But until we start recognizing the real cost of the infrastructure, transportation, alternative transportation systems like light rail and streetcar are always going to seem costly. So that's a philosophical take on it. But I think promoting and funding transportation infrastructure, streetcar, light rail, is very important. Uh, Lily Mandel, a member, if you had uh, your druthers, or if you were king, what one thing would you like to build? I, it's actually addressed to all of you. Any takers on that? We're all saying, oh, somebody could else go first if I can have time to think. <laughs> <laughs> Take it, Randy. No, no, no. <laughs> um, well, right now I've been thinking about uh, uh, what what does the River District need? Because I'm, I'm sort of um, um, finding myself uh, in increasingly sort of disappointed with what's going on down there. And it's not to say there hasn't been a lot of good things that have been down there, but I'm not feeling a, the same sort of sense of forward energy. Um, and I don't mean, uh, I, I, Peter Walker's park plan, I, I think, is quite innovative and, and um, you know, uh, if it, um, you know, is able to be funded um, and some of the uh, neighboring condo owners don't, uh, um, shoot it down. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of possibility there, but I'm thinking about a building. I'm thinking about uh, a facility down there. Um, and what I, I guess I would like to see is, is some sort of um, community center. And I don't mean, um, you know, neighborhood center. Uh, 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 I'm talking about a city community center that is uh, flex space, that's uh, uh, potential, th you know, theater, potential exhibition space, some place that's kind of an urban think tank um, that would essentially be uh, a, a way of, of, partic uh, of, of fueling the ideas uh, for what should happen with the remaining blocks down there so that uh, uh, we could have, say, a design competition and show it down there and, and get the, the entire city uh, um, to, to, to go there instead of it being just kind of a, a closed uh, you know, group of, of you know, fairly wealthy condo owners and, and uh, Wyden and Kennedy employees. <laughs> if, if I were king, um, I think what I would do is uh, knock some heads together in Eugene and Corvallis, and I would put together um, higher education funding to establish a world-class university here in Portland, which is what we deserve. Those are both, both really great ideas, and I, I would love to be involved as a designer, but as a little more pragmatic, <laughs> A little more pragmatic, I think, in terms of what we need overall, Lily, I would actually just rebuild a couple of things I've already seen. One would be a fairly straightforward courtyard apartment complex that you can see in almost any neighborhood in Portland that would get us the density goals that we need in our neighborhoods and not throw up god-awful row houses that destroy the public realm and destroy the neighborhood's confidence that they can change. The second thing, because that'll help us make the neighborhoods revitalized and, and get off of this shtick about row, density equals row houses equals bad equals stop everything. Second, if we want to do better density downtown and in the central areas that already have the infrastructure and the services and the cultural complexity, I think we could pull a a block, including the courtyards and open spaces and the edge buildings. I'd like to pull a block straight from the Falls Creek area in Vancouver, BC, and transplant it into the River District or North McAdam, and just let it sit there and percolate and inspire and prove that this can be done in a progressive and urban and neighborhood sensitive way. And I'm just going to quickly respond. If I was king, I'd again, fast forward 30 years, and they'd say, even though he was the developer king, uh, 
what he did was that he built the South North light rail. He built the line to Gresham. Uh, he built the line, excuse me, to Oregon City. He built the Hawthorne streetcar line. He built the MLK streetcar line, and he built the streetcar line to Lake Oswego. And 30 years from now, we'll be given kudos for having accomplished those tasks. Bill hey, Mandel, member, and the other half of the team of designated provocateurs. Uh, just a side comment, Patty. Innovation is not synonymous with flash. And for John Carroll, you left off a very important name on your list in Portland. That's Bill Nato. Excuse me. All right, now, the other half of the question. If you were king, what single project would you like to tear down? Now, Charlie, <laughs> Charlie Hales has already usurped the most obvious, the f oh. freeway. But I'll leave it up to the rest of you to work that out. <laughs> Is it going to be a race here? Or? <laughs> <laughs> the bottom building. <laughs> Seriously? I'm right. just kidding. Well, I know one building that I wouldn't want to tear down now because I think it did an awful lot to galvanize us around the importance of design guidelines, and that's the uh, what was First Interstate Wells Fargo Tower. That, in one fell swoop, symbolized and codified everything wrong with an urban building. And that kicked us into high gear to do it right. So I, it's funny. I almost think instead of tearing down something, we should build something that's equally bad to help inspire us to get into the, the mode that I talked about earlier. <laughs> I'm going to wield my sledgehammer at the first interstate building. It, it's so awful. Um, it's such an anti-personnel uh, building. And, um, uh, and I think that's still the best target. Um, it's done its job, so we can do it. I'm going to go to my, my uh, 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 usual whipping post and talk about the uh, Civic Stadium apartments. Because um, I walk by that every day. Uh, and and um, it's sort of a rejoinder to what I wish I'd answered the last question, uh, Lily's question with, is, is what we're, one thing I would really like to see built is an excellent transit-oriented development, because uh, we don't have one yet. Not one. We built two light rail lines, and, then we're, and we're still awaiting, you know, the model for transit-oriented development, which is high density, directly uh, next to the uh, um, to the rail station that gradually tapers down into a walkable neighborhood. And Arenco's getting close, but um, still not there. Um, and, but uh, the Civic Stadium Apartments is an absolute disaster. I just, I was being facetious about the Portland building, but I'd like to say, I, I guess I wouldn't tear one building down, because then what's the next one? And then what's the next one? And what's the next one after that? And I think every now and then there's a there's an opportunity to have a conversation about First Interstate or your least favorite building, but it's all part of the architectural fabric. And I'm not sure that there's any building that I would tear down at this point. We've got time for one more brief question. Thank you, Lloyd. Uh, I was hoping you're going to say the East Bank Freeway. Um, Andrew Wheeler, uh, growth happens, and uh, in the international city of Vancouver that Gary was referring to on uh, the Lost Creek area, uh, there are huge point towers, and, and the Canadians in Vancouver would say that we should develop that way, and that growth should happen in high point towers. Uh, they are, in fact, maybe 200 feet apart. But uh, we seem to have a different philosophy about that, and I think maybe we ought to have a little bit of a discussion on that to whomever might answer that. Well, I'll jump in first. I, ever since being a student of architecture, I've had an absolute horror of Corbusier's Ville Radieuse, which, in which the idea was that you have a series of point blocks with park all the way around them. And it seems such a splendid idea from the point of view of getting away from the awful slums and ghettos of, of Europe. But the reality is that that approach absolutely decimates a community. You lose the whole business of conversations with the neighbor when you're putting out the recycling, that kind of thing. It just doesn't happen. Um, I think that there is certainly a place in any city for some uh, um, high-rise living. But as a model for us to emulate, I think it's inappropriate.